All right. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, obviously um, the sermon tonight is going to be on the subject of heaven. This morning we did an in-depth sermon on, on hell and, and what a horrible place hell is and, and just not a pleasant topic, not a pleasant sermon. You know, I don't think anybody left here like in a great mood and just feeling real uplifted from this morning's sermon, but it was necessary. It was necessary because... You know, a few of us already went out soul winning this afternoon, and we need to keep that in mind and continue to do that and continue to remember how important it is and how important of a subject it is. But tonight, hopefully we can leave here a lot more uplifted because now I'm going to be preaching about the subject of heaven. And that's a, a very generic term, but we're going to dig into a lot of things um, where the, there's descriptions of, of heaven or, I guess, the... Uh, uh, maybe a more accurate term is going to be like, you know, our existence with eternal life. Because it's not all just in heaven. There's the millennial reign of Christ, and there's also after that the new heavens and the new earth. So we're going to kind of dig into all of that. Um, people have a tendency to just kind of mix everything together and say this is heaven. But we're going to see some of the different examples and places in the Bible that, that give some descriptions that it's not all just talking about heaven. Heaven is a generic term. I'm, I catch myself doing the same thing as just the place that we're going to go after we die, you know, without giving thought to everything, all the other events that will happen um, in the future. So that being said, we started off here in 2 Corinthians 12. Very, very basically... The Bible teaches that there's three heavens. So if you look down in your Bible in verse number two, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. So he's writing. He says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So 14 years ago, he knew this man. He says, whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. So here we see a reference to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, I want to cover this real briefly. I mentioned it this morning in the Sermon on Hell, how some people believe that paradise existed in hell, and, not, and then it transported at the resurrection of Jesus Christ into heaven. And it's an entire doctrine made up of, uh, it's just, it's really kind of bizarre when you think about it, but, but they had to reconcile the Bible when, if you remember when Jesus Christ was, was crucified on the cross, the thief that was next to him that got saved, Jesus Christ said to him, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. So because Jesus Christ said that, and because we know that Jesus Christ went to hell, this entire doctrine saying, well, there must be a good side of hell, that you know, that paradise must have been in hell, all of this stuff comes from that one statement of Jesus Christ saying that unto the thief without giving any heed or any recognition to the fact that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh and Jesus Christ had already said, I and my Father are one. And, and basically, you know, if that man were to go to heaven, he would be with Jesus. He'd be with God. You know, there is the, the triune God. Yes, Jesus Christ went to hell, but in the sense that Jesus Christ was God, there's, there's no contradiction or problem with the Scripture in understanding it in that simple way. But because people don't want to believe that, they say, well, no, he's going to be with me. He's going to be with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ went to hell. Well, the first problem with that is that if Jesus Christ said that to him, if he was going to be with him in hell, then he was burning and being tortured and tormented in hell, which doesn't make sense because I've already proved that this morning. That's where Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ was not in some good compartment of hell. He was not in some paradise of hell. He was paying for our sins in hell. He was being punished for our sins in hell. That's where he was. So, so this doctrine is weird. And not only that, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, this is the reason why they say paradise was relocated because it's apparent, it's obvious. It says how that he was caught up into paradise. Paradise is up. Paradise is, he's referring to heaven. He's not talking about, and I mean, just the word paradise, like who, how in the world can you say paradise is in hell? It just doesn't make any sense. There are no positive connotations, no positive readings of the word hell in the Bible at all. 
to say, oh, well, yeah, there's a paradise there. It, it's all just a false doctrine. But I don't want to get too much into that because we got a lot to cover tonight about heaven. But here we see another word for heaven is paradise. Okay, it's synonymous and it's up. And the location of heaven today is up. And we see here that he saw a man that was caught up to the third heaven. Again, caught up. He was caught up to the third heaven. There are three heavens. I'm going to explain them to you real briefly. Um, and if you want to turn back to Genesis 1, you can turn back to Genesis 1 because we'll see this defined. And if you were to do a word study in the Bible looking up all the uses of the word heaven or heavens, the vast majority of those times, the, the, the very vast majority of those times, it's not referring to the third heaven. Most of it is referring to the air. So the first heaven is just the air that we breathe. It's the place where the birds fly, right? You look in the air. Birds fly through the air, that's the heaven. The Bible refers to that as heaven. The second heaven is what we might refer to as outer space. Okay, when you go beyond our atmosphere, there's still the heaven. The heavens where the stars exist, where the planet, the sun, the moon, the stars, those are in the heavens. That The Bible refers to the host of the heavens, talking about the stars and people who worship the host of heavens. And... Um, then the third heaven is what we would think of as heaven, as God's dwelling place, the place where God is, the place where God's throne is. Okay, that is in heaven. That's the third heaven. In Genesis chapter 1, well, let's um, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So obviously every, everything is a creation. Even the heaven where God exists is a creation. That's where God, God exists. He created heaven. He created the heaven and the earth. Jump down to verse 7. It says, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the, first, were the second day. Sorry. That firmament is the first heaven. That's the heaven that we're talking about. That's the, the waters that were below the heaven is the waters on this earth, the lakes, the rivers, right? That's those waters. And the waters above would be the atmosphere, you know, the clouds where we have rain from heaven that comes from above there. So in between that, there's this firmament and that he's naming and defining as heaven. That is the first heaven. Um, jump down to verse 14. You can say, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let there be signs and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and he made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth so it's all heaven you're saying wait you just said that the firmament was was you know the first heaven well the firmament, when he's saying here, is about the heaven. God called the firmament heaven. The firmament, he's also talking about the place where he puts the stars and the sun and the moon. Even though there's a first, second, and third heaven, it's still all heaven. Right? Heaven goes the air and upward. So there's a generic term you could say, the heaven. Well, which one are you talking about? It's still, it's still heaven. Right? Um, does that make sense? I mean, there's, there's, there's the air, and it all consists. It's, it's all basically the heaven. But... Um, when he's referring to the first heaven, it's the air we breathe. Um, that's, that's, that's closer to us. The second heaven goes up higher, and the third heaven is even farther away. Um, and turn, to, if you would, to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to see man's attempt at trying to reach. So we saw in Genesis um, 1, we already saw the first heaven and the second heaven were, were being um, defined there. And then in Genesis 11, 4, we're going to see a reference to the third heaven where God is. And this is the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Look at verse number four. It says, And they said, Go to, let us, build, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Obviously, they're not talking about the first heaven because any building that you make is going to reach the first heaven. They weren't either just talking about the second heaven they were talking about, basically, this is like a work salvation. They wanted to work and build something to reach unto God, to reach unto heaven. 
and um, that was a great sin. God confounded their language and spread them across the earth. Um, Deuteronomy 10, 14, you have to turn there, it says, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. So the third heaven could also be referred to as the heaven of heavens. Because you have the first and the second heaven, and then the third heaven is the heaven of heavens. Um, <clears throat> 2 Kings 8, 27. I'm just going to read some of these to you. Go ahead and turn, if you would, to Matthew 22 while I'm reading some of these passages. 1 Kings 8, verse 27 says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. So this was Solomon talking about, you know, they built this temple. It was supposed to be God's dwelling place. It was supposed to be his, his, the place where God exists. And they're explaining here, look, we understand. Look, how can I build a, God, a house for God to dwell in? God is omnipresent, as we were already talking about earlier this morning, that God is everywhere. God cannot be contained. He cannot be put into a box. He cannot be put into a small place. He, and he's saying the heaven and even the heaven of heavens cannot contain God. Even with the expanse of this universe and how big everything is, that still is not large enough to contain God. Yes, we have a very big God, and that's, and that's comforting to know that. And uh, I'm going to continue reading here in 1 Kings 8. Verse 28 says, Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place, and hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. So again, you see, at first he says, you know, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain God. But then he goes back and refers to, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. Heaven is referred to as God's dwelling place. Again, we're going to see that's where his throne is. Um, well, I'll say, for lack of better terms, that's where God likes to hang out. That's where God is. Okay, God is everywhere in the sense that he is omnipresent, yet um, God's dwelling place, so to speak, is in heaven. It's the third heaven. Um, 1 Kings twenty two nineteen 19 shows us that his throne is in heaven. It says, and he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. So what we're starting off here is trying to get a picture or an idea of what is heaven like. And that's what I like to be able to do is describe what heaven is going to be like. There's not a lot of, of description of, of heaven itself. Typically, when we see any descriptions of, of heaven, it's often revolving around his throne and the angels and the beasts and, and the elders and the things that are, that are around his throne. We get descriptions of that. But in general, what life will be like for us in heaven, I had a really hard time trying to figure out what that, what that is going to be. But the Bible says, and it's not in my notes, but that I have not, not seen or ear heard, neither entered in the heart of man, what God hath prepared for them that love him. Whatever it is that God has prepared for us, it's beyond our imagination. No matter how good of a place you might think it is, it's even better. And that is really cool and that is very comforting to think that. And, and you know what? I, I bet you it's the same way with hell. No matter how bad people think hell is today. You know, we were talking to that guy today and he said, um, he kind of made this reference to, to hell being on earth. And he didn't just believe that. Some people believe that like, no, hell is just this life on earth. There is no literal hell. He didn't believe that like some people do. But people kind of get this notion of thinking, oh, well, just because I'm going through hard times or struggles or just because I live in Arizona, it's really hot, that this must just be like hell on earth. No, you have no clue how bad heaven is. Or, excuse me, how bad hell is. I don't know how many times if I just said that recently. I hope I didn't switch heaven for hell too many times. Um, hell is a horrible place. But heaven, again, the exact opposite. 
Whatever we might think or imagine how good of a place it is, it's even better. God has prepared a place for us that is going to be amazing. Now, you're in Matthew chapter 22. One of the things we see here is that we will not be married. If you're married today, there is not going to be people who are married in heaven. We're going to be individuals, but, but there's not going to be a marriage. And, um, you know, it kind of makes sense if you figure that, that as Christians, we're, going to be, we're the bride of Christ. We're going to be married to God, so to speak, right? Um, the Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 28, says, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now, I'll have to correct myself again already. Um, I don't believe that there's going to be any marriage in heaven. But specifically, this reference is talking about the resurrection. Now, at the resurrection, this is um, when we're going to receive our new bodies and we're going to, you know, and Christ is going to rapture us up. And then at the end of him pouring out his wrath is when the millennial reign will be, the millennial kingdom will be set up. So definitely, specifically in, the, in that millennial kingdom, there's not going to be marriages. We're not going to be given in marriage. But I believe that goes for heaven as well. I mean, it's until death do you part as the vow when a person dies physically on this earth. Um, we're going to be like the angels of heaven in the sense that we do not marry or are given in marriage. Um, another, another aspect of heaven, you're in Matthew 22, flip back to chapter number 6, is that the Bible says that we can actually lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. And what better place to store treasures than heaven? The Bible says that um, in Matthew 6, look at verse number 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So, any treasures that we can lay up for ourselves in this world, in this lifetime, a, steal can, a, a, steal, a, a thief can come and steal that stuff. I mean, if I were to amass wealth, let's say I were to get a big treasure of like gold coins worth, you know, millions of dollars, that would be a cool treasure to have. But anything that we have in this world, someone else can come and steal that. Some, you know, it can, it can vanish. It could, it could corrupt. You know, it, it, could, it could rust. It can, it can just diminish. It can be demolished. It could be destroyed. It could come to nothing. But the treasures that we lay up in heaven... God keep those. He promises. He says, look, thieves are not going to break through and steal those treasures. They're safe. I mean, it's safer than a bank. Like today, if you have some kind of treasures, you know, you might want to put them in a, in a bank that has a vault and they're secured and locked away. Hey, even banks, none of that is for sure. None of that is definitely going to be secure because thieves still break into banks. They break into vaults. They steal these things and it can be lost. But if it's in heaven, that's the best bank, that's the best vault you can lay up your treasures because you know that God's watching that and God will take care of that. It's not going to corrupt. It's not going to rust. No one's going to steal it. These are treasures that are 100% sure for you to have. So you think about that. Um, you know, we work hard as men, especially on this earth, to, to try to support our families and hopefully we're not too focused on laying up those treasures for ourselves. A lot of people get carried away with their retirement plans and their 401ks and all this other stuff. And the way that those work, typically, you're taking a small portion of your paycheck. And I'm not against 401ks, so don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying like it's evil or wicked if you're, laying, if you're putting stuff in a way in a retirement. But that shouldn't be your focus and it shouldn't just be like your goal. We need to be focused on the, the heavenly treasures. But the way that it works is that, you know, every couple weeks or every week, every time you get paid, there's a little portion of that paycheck getting put away, getting put away, getting put away, getting put away. You're put away so that you can, you can lay up this great treasure to have later. Well, what we ought to be focused on is doing the same thing except with heavenly treasures. So, 
Every single day, every single week, every time that you go out soul winning, every time you're going out and serving God, what you're doing is you're laying up a little piece of treasure for yourself in heaven. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And if you can be consistent with this, if you can serve God to the maximum, if you can do as much as possible, and even if it's not like all big, you know, like soul winning marathons all the time, look, it's not going to be like that, but you'll get way more treasure if you can just be consistent, even just doing one hour a week. Just that little bit of time in your entire week, if you're able to spend one hour one hour devoted to doing that, but you're able to do that hour every single week, 52 weeks a year for, let's say, even for 10 years. That's five, over 5,000 weeks or 500 weeks. Excuse me. My math isn't even right tonight. I don't know what I'm doing. Over 500 weeks of, uh, 500 hours of, of serving God and that's soul winning, all amassed and accumulated and laid up as treasure. Um, for yourself in heaven that is not going to go away. If the stock market crashes, that's still there. There's nothing that can change that. You know, your 401k can all come to nothing if, the, if your market crashes or whatever. If, the, if they totally hyperinflate the dollar and it becomes meaningless, then you could have all this money put away and all the value is just gone, right? But the treasure that you lay up in heaven will retain its value. The treasure you lay up in heaven you know, you, you decide to be consistent. You say, I'm going to make this a part of my life. Hey, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I don't even think about this very often. But that's going to be, what a pleasant surprise that's going to be when you get to heaven, when, when you receive the rewards for the things that you've done and be like, you know, hopefully you'll be able to say, wow, I actually did a lot for God. That, that's, that's great. You have all of this treasure that you're receiving from God for doing all that work for him. Um, but every single week you might not even notice it because it's just a little bit that you're doing. It's a little bit, but as it accumulates over time, you'll have that. We can lay up these treasures for ourselves. but let's keep going here. Turn, if you would, to Revelation. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in Revelation. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 4. So we're going to look back to see what does heaven kind of look like to give us um, just a picture. What's it like? You know, um, you know, oftentimes people talk about the streets being paid with gold and all this other stuff. That's not necessarily in heaven. There's the heavenly Jerusalem that does come down from heaven. But um, where we specifically will be in heaven, I can't say. But let's look at some of these um, descriptions in Revelation chapter 4. We're going to see real quick. I'll try, to, I'll try to get through this quick. I know I got a lot of notes here. Basically, we're going to see the 24 elders. There's a sea of glass and the four beasts that are full of eyes. Um, Revelation 4 and verse number 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, and which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So this is when John is caught up in the spirit and he goes to heaven. As he says, there's a door open in heaven. So John goes through that door and he's in heaven now. It says, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So the first thing he sees is this great throne and God sitting on that throne. And he says, and he, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So there's this great throne and then there's this great rainbow surrounding the throne. And, you know, every time we see a description of God, there's, you see the word glory, right? God and his glory. That word glory, it really just means like a shining bright light. Like that's what is glory. So there's a, the Bible refers to the stars have the, a glory and then the sun has a glory and the moon has a glory. Their glory because they're differing in, in the amount of light that they're putting off. So the stars, obviously, when we look up at them, there's only a little bit of light coming from them. You look at the moon. The moon, when it's a full moon, you could actually see enough to, to walk around and, and to navigate and to see trees and to see other things. You can see the moon has its own glory that it shines on the earth. But then the sun, obviously, that the moon's glory is nothing like the sun's. When it's daytime, it's daylight. You can see everything just fine. Um, anyways, those are 
that's what, what glory is. So when, when God has this great brightness and His glory surrounding Him, there's a rainbow that, that is also going around God. And that's, that's, this is a vision in heaven. And then he says in verse 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So these are men, these are elders that, that are sitting in seats around the throne, 24 of them. They're clothed in white, and they've got a crown of gold on their head. Okay, just to try to visualize this. This is, this is a vision that John had in heaven. And he says in verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. So it's a pretty magnificent probably will instill a little bit of fear too what you see like God in all his glory and there's lightnings and thunderings and it's just just extreme power right held by God and it says there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And then it describes the four beasts. I'm not going to get into that right now. And they, sing, they say unto God, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And that's what these, these beasts are saying and um, the, the, the 24 elders, they fall down before Him and they worship God and they, they cast their, their crowns before, before God and just say, you know, we're not worthy of this, you're worthy, and that's how they worship God. They get down on their hands and knees and they, 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 you know, they worship God in that way. And this is, this is something that's actually happening in heaven. This is a vision that, God, that John sees of all of these things happening, and it's happening in heaven. Just to give you a little bit of picture of what heaven, like, heaven is like, let's turn to, to Revelation chapter 6. In verse number 9, remember, John is still in heaven, so he's still witnessing these things. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So, one thing to note, there is an altar in heaven. And John is seeing here the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, those that were martyred. And again, this is talking about during the tribulation time. If you get it in context, I'm not going to get into that. But he sees these souls, the souls of men. So they're men's souls that, that are before the altar. And um, it says in verse 10, They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they're speaking unto God. They have access to be able to talk unto God in heaven. These souls that, that are before the altar, that are under the altar. It says in verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So again, they're clothed in white. They're given white robes. And that white is, a, is symbolic of purity, of being sinless. Obviously, their bodies aren't in heaven. Their bodies are st were still here on earth. Their soul was caught up in the heaven. And this is what John was able to see. And I don't know exactly what form they look like. I assume they look like men. He knew that they were souls of men. So they must be kind of like an outline or shape of a man's body that, that a soul has. Um, I would imagine it probably looks exactly like the human body. Um, but then they were able to be covered with white robes. And um, there before the throne, let's look at verse chapter number 7. Verse number 13 says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? So it was like, Who are these guys, and where did they come from? And I said unto him, verse 14, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So again, that, if that's not enough evidence for you to understand that these people who are under the altar that we just read about in chapter 6, he explains it in chapter 7. Look, they came out of great tribulation. Um, I'm not going to go any more into detail than that because it, it proves it right there for you. Let's keep reading. Verse 15 says, Therefore are they before the throne of God 
and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Now, I'm going to stop right there. We're going to keep reading, but look at what they're doing. It says they're serving God. Now, people tend to have this idea of what it's going to be like in heaven. And they think, oh man, in heaven I'm going to do like, like all these fun things just with all of my free time. I'm going to, I'm going to do this stuff and it's going to be whatever it is that I want to do. And that's how, what their vision of heaven is. Like, like anything I want. I want to fly. I want to go this. I want to go snowboarding. I want to do all these cool things. And they think that must be what heaven's like because it's the most fun thing I could possibly do. That is not what the Bible says at all anywhere. That's just something that you've made up in your own mind. Now, we know that heaven is going to be great and it's going to be wonderful for us. But understand what's going on here. It says you're going to be serving God. Serving God in his temple day and night. And, and uh, it says, And he that, that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Which is nice. I mean, we're going to be in the presence of God all the time. He's going to dwell with us. But our, we're going to have a job. So get used to that. If you don't like serving God now, you better get used to it because that's what you're going to be doing is serving God. Now, it sounds counterintuitive being in our fleshly body, especially with a fleshly mind, that how can it be joyful to serve? How is that a good thing? How is that a positive thing to, to serve? Anyone who's done it should know that it is. It's actually a great thing. It's one of the best things, even just for yourself personally. Like for myself personally, I love the feeling. I love being able to look back at work that I've done for God where I've helped and served other people. I actually prefer that to any of the fun that I go out and do that you might say like is a vacation or a... Um, the way that I would spend my free time, whether it's going out target shooting, whether it's doing any other things that you consider to be fun. Um, serving others, doing things for others is, is one of the greatest joys that you can have in your life. So you look at this and be like, oh man, well that just sounds like a bunch of work. No, when you actually do it, you'll realize that, yeah, it may be work, but what you receive from that work is, is amazing. Um, it's it's kind of like the feeling that you get if anyone's ever worked really, really hard on a project, on an assignment, on, on anything, whatever it is that you want to do. You, you get yourself involved and it's a real difficult task. When you get to the end of that task, that sense, that feeling of accomplishment is great. And the harder you work for something, the harder you work at it, when you actually get to the end and it turns out great and all the hard work, all the effort you poured into it, you see the fruit of that, you see the result of that, it's a great sense of accomplishment. It's a feeling that you, you can't really describe. You just have to have done it in order to understand that, that feeling. Um, I could think of you know, people in sports that they work and they work and they labor and they strive and they practice and they, they try to get themselves better and, and they, they increase their endurance and they increase their strength. They do all this stuff all for one race. And then when they win that race, that sense of accomplishment, that feeling, all the hard work they put into it, it was all worth it. It's, it's this great feeling, it's this great joy that you experience. That's something that you get through doing the work. Well, when we serve God, you have to understand that this is going to be very joyous for us. It's going to be a very happy thing for us to be able to do is to be able to serve Him, serve the one that has given us so much love, that loves us so much, that, that gave His only begotten Son to pay for our sins and, and has done so many things for us. Yes, we are going to be serving Him. So one of the things I would suggest getting ready for heaven would be start serving God now. Let's start doing that and get, and get prepared for what we're going to be doing in the future. And you can experience a little bit of that joy from serving Him in this lifetime. Verse number 16, we're going to see a little bit more though, um, a little bit more common thoughts about heaven. It says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. So when you're in heaven, you're never going to get hungry again. You're going to experience that discomfort of being hungry. 
or being thirsty. It's just, it's not going to be there. And he says that there's not going to, <laughs> that might be a fun thing to, to realize then from coming from Phoenix, you know, the sun's never going to light on them nor any heat. You're not going to be sweating and, and being extremely uncomfortable in the heat. It says in verse 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God will be there dwelling among us to comfort us, to, to wipe away all tears from your eyes. And you think of, oh, well, if there's not going to be a sunlight, well, is there just going to be darkness then? No, because the Lamb is the light. God is the light. There is still going to be, heaven's going to be bright. It says there's going to be, no, we're going to see that in a little bit. There is no darkness there. It's always going to be light. It's always going to be daytime. But the light isn't going to be coming from the sun. It's going to be coming from the sun, the sun of righteousness, the sun of God. That's where the light is going to be coming from. It's not going to be coming from this gaseous star in, the, in our solar system, from that sun. Um, we're not going to be hungry. We're not going to be thirsty. We're not going to experience that type of heat. God's going to comfort us. He's going to wipe all tears from our eyes. He's going to be there for us. Um, I want to mention this, that the, the tabernacle actually exists in heaven. And I'm getting a little bit off track here. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 15. We'll see that. I got probably more scriptures than I need for this point. But um, in Exodus 25, 9, the Bible says, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So the tabernacle that Moses built on this earth, the physical one, the tent, you know, the, the, all the coverings and everything that, he, that went into the temple, God showed him what he, how he needed to make it because what he made was an earthly representation of the tabernacle that already exists in heaven, that already existed. Moses was just kind of copying that and making a tabernacle here on earth. And um, God showed it to him. He showed him the pattern thereof. And Isaiah 37, 16 says, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. And you remember the mercy seat that he created that was in the, in the um, tabernacle had the, the, the two angels, the two cherubims that were both looking toward the seat and their wings spread across behind it. And in Isaiah 37, it says that God that dwelleth between the cherubims. This was all just a picture of what reality is like in heaven. Hebrews 8, 5 says, Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed, thee, showed to thee in the mount. And... Um, I'm not going to read Hebrews 9. I was going to go there. But um, it's just more scriptures showing that the, the patterns of things in the heaven should be purified with the sprinkling of blood or um, you, the, those that were on the earth, but then the heavenly things with better sacrifices. Um, but to, you're in Revelation 15. Look at verse number 5. It says, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven. There's, there is a temple of the tabernacle. It's in, and it exists in heaven. It says, And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So this is a vision that John saw again in heaven where the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God. So the smoke fills the temple and no one's able to enter into the temple then until all the plagues are fulfilled. Um, so what do we see so far in heaven? There's, there's a temple. The things that we see described, and I didn't go through any of this, but if you're interested, you know, go through the books of Moses, go through Exodus, go through and see all the detail of all the things that existed there. That's what you'll see in heaven. Because that's a pattern of those things. Um, the tabernacle that exists in heaven, God's throne. We're not going to be hungry. We're not going to be thirsty. There's going to be no sun there. God's going to provide the light. Now, 
if we were to die today, like as believers, before Christ comes back, obviously heaven is the place where we're going to go. Um, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So once we're absent from our body, that's where we'll be. We'll go to be present with the Lord if you're saved. And then um, I also want to point out that saved people have always gone to heaven when they died. Again, that, that, that nonsense of paradise and the center of the earth and all this other stuff. Um, I've preached a sermon on this already, but um, can be done away with, with, with a few scripture references. One would be Elijah. 2 Kings 2.1 says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha unto Gilgal. And um, in verse 11 it says, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So even back in the Old Testament when Elijah, God took Elijah, he took him to heaven. He took him up to the third heaven. He didn't just take him up into the air. God took Elijah into heaven, which is where people, saved believers, have always gone. Now, Understanding some of the descriptions of heavenly places in the Bible, things that you might think of or turn to to get more of a description. We already saw some in Revelation. That is in heaven. Those are the visions that John saw in heaven. Everything that we had read to this point is talking about that, that place in heaven. So you want to be just discerning. Not that it's, you know, I don't think you're going to come up with any major false doctrine, but um, just for your own understanding, when we're reading, especially in the Old Testament, it's a little bit harder to understand than the New Testament. Um, but we see different references, and we're going to look at a, a few of them, that there are different events that are going to happen. The first thing, like up until this point, is when a believer dies, we go to heaven, right? Not, the rest of the future events haven't happened yet. But when we're looking at these prophecies in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that talk about these wonderful places and places where we'll be, and, um, and, and you see, you'd think, oh, well, that's heaven. Not necessarily heaven. Because, like I said, there's, there are descriptions of heaven, which we've already seen some of those, but there's also descriptions of how the earth is going to be like during the millennial reign of Christ. So, at the first resurrection, when Jesus Christ comes back, we have the great tribulation. Then we're going to be caught up. Those of us that are alive and remain will be caught up together with those that are asleep in Christ. And so shall we be ever with Christ. He's going to come and He's going to take us from this earth. So all the believers at that point are going to be resurrected. We're going to get our new bodies. We're going to be with Christ. God's going to continue to pour out His wrath on the earth for the next about approximately three and a half years. After that, Christ is going to set up his kingdom. And he's going to reign, he's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And it's going to be a perfect, obviously a perfect government. Jesus Christ will be reigning. He'll have instituted his laws and his rules, and that is what we're going to be living under. And there are some descriptions in the Bible, I believe, that are referring to this time period of that millennial reign. And because it's going to be such a great time, you know, the animals are going to be, you know, everything is going to be the way that, that God would intend things to be run here on earth. And when you look at descriptions, it's not always necessarily talking about heaven. It could be referring to that millennial reign of Christ. And then after that, there's, there's after the millennial reign is when the, the heaven and earth are going to pass away and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So all three of these things are all going to be good places for us, right? Whether we're on this earth during the millennial reign of Christ, whether we're up in heaven before that happens, or whether we're, we're on the new heaven and new earth, after the millennial reign of Christ. Those are all good places. So we're going to see positive references, all three of them, but we're going to want to pay attention to that and um, just look to, we had a proper understanding of which ones we're referring to. Now, let's look at Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4 in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. 
Micah chapter 4, we're going to see a description of Jesus' millennial reign here on this earth. Micah chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. When the heavenly kingdom, when, when Jesus Christ's kingdom is set up, he's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And that's where it says, all and people shall flow unto it. People are going to be coming into Jerusalem where Jesus is reigning from that place. And it says um, in verse 3, And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So we see the, during the millennial reign, it's a time of great peace. It's a time where, where there's going to be no need for these weapons because Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. He's going to make sure that there is no war. There is no need for war because it's a, it, this will be the proper one world government. It's going to be with Jesus Christ at the head and it's going to be peace. And see, all these things, this is what the, the Antichrist is going to try to make this happen early when he comes. He's going to be espousing all these things. He's going to be one saying he's going to do all these things because he wants to be like the Most High. He's trying to be an imitator uh, uh, um, of Jesus Christ. And But this, is, this scripture is referring to that millennial reign when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on this earth that, that you know, people are going to beat their swords into plowshares you know, they're going to turn instruments of war into instruments of work because you're not going to need those weapons anymore. People aren't going to learn to fight. They're not going to learn war anymore because there's going to be no need for that with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. Verse number four says, But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And again, during the millennial reign, there's going to be people that are not saved on this earth. Because not everything is destroyed when God pours out His wrath. When God pours out His wrath on the earth, the entire, every single person in the entire world is not just completely destroyed and demolished at the end of that. Because... There's still going to be people left over, and there's going to be nations that are ruled over for a thousand years. So when the, when the rapture takes place, all of us saved are going to be raptured out of this earth. But then there's going to, the world's going to be left with all of the rest of the unsaved. Now, some of those people are going to take the mark of the beast, and they're all going to go to hell because they've taken the mark of the beast. But I don't think even every single person that's left on the earth is going to take the mark of the beast. There's still going to be some people left. Yeah, a lot of people are going to be dying during these great plagues, but the Bible never records that every single person is going to be wiped out. So when Jesus sets up his kingdom, when Jesus sets that up, there's still going to be people left. Now, he's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, and there aren't going to be any wars. It's going to be a perfect kingdom. But not everybody is going to be saved. And, and that's one of the things that, that as believers we're going to be doing is ruling and reigning with Christ. We're going to be ruling and reigning over these nations. All throughout the Bible, you've seen all throughout our human history, you've had kings that have been established and there have been other world governments, but that one king isn't alone in ruling. That might, that's the supreme power and the supreme authority, but that king always has other kings of other nations and of other regions that are also reigning, but the one is the supreme power, just like Jesus Christ is going to be that supreme king. He is going to be over everybody, but as we're ruling and reigning with him, we will have our own areas and divisions that we are going to be ruling and reigning over. So the people, even the people who are unsaved, who are still alive during this time, 
they're going to be uh, you know, under this government, under Jesus Christ's government, and there'll be righteous leaders everywhere that are, that are ruling and reigning with Christ. But, um, you know, that there's still, it's, it's going to be a great time. It's going to be, we're going to see how things should have been set up on earth and the way things uh, were supposed to be. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 11. We'll see another reference here to that, to that time frame. Isaiah 11, verse number 1 reads, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove the equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Now we start seeing these, you know, um, these animals, and animals that were previously predators and dangerous that, that you'd have to, even humans have to look out for them are not going to be dangerous anymore. Now, here we know we're talking about at least one of the two time frames that's going to be taking place on earth. The Bible gives us zero descriptions of animals in heaven. Um, there are beasts, but the beasts that are described are not beasts like we have on this earth. They're always other created beings of God. You know, they're full of eyes, and they, they look maybe like a, like a lion, or they look like these other animals, but that's not what they are. They have the seraphims and, um, and the angels. You know, I'm, we see these other descriptions in heaven. So we know that we're not talking about in heaven here. Um, and this is also talking about, we saw in context at the beginning, that Jesus Christ is going to come forth with a rod. He's going to be ruling. He's going to be reigning. This is during his reign. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. So, it's an amazing time of peace. You have no need to worry, for one, we saw of wars, because they're going to turn their swords in, into, into plow, plowshares. You know, they're going to they're make it so that, Jesus is going to make it so that there's no more war. People don't even have to learn how to fight. And we don't have to worry about these, you know, snakes or scorpions or any of these other animals that can inflict harm or danger on us. It's going to be a, a time of, of total peace. And even it says a child shall lead them. So a child is going to be perfectly safe with around any of the animals of the field because they're not going to be out to destroy us or to hurt us or to injure us in any way. Um, Verse 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And that's kind of great too because it says that um, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Everybody's going to know about God at this point. There's not going to be ignorant people there's not going to be people who are ignorant of, of the fact that God exists, who God is, the God of the Bible. He's going to be known during this time frame. It's going to be impossible for people not to know him. He's going to be ruling and reigning. Now, I'm going to try to wrap things up quickly here. There's two battles that take place. And again, it's a little bit important. We're kind of going a little bit into end time stuff. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 19. We're going to spend the rest of the time in Revelation. Revelation gives us the most insight into these things, into the, into the future and into the, into the way that heaven's going to be. There are other descriptions in the Old Testament, and I looked at a few of them, but oftentimes with the prophecies of the Old Testament, 
They're not as clear as the New Testament. Um, there's mixtures of prophecies going on within chapters. Some of it is talking about things that are going to happen immediately in the time frame of, uh, of, of what's going on there, a lot closer to that time, as well as prophesying a future end time event. Um, it's, it's harder to get the exact time frames of all of those events that are taking place. And sometimes multiple events can be can be kind of mushed together into one prophecy of the Old Testament. It's not quite as clear. That's why we have the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation that, that Jesus has given unto us in the Bible to understand these events more clearly. It's been revealed. Um, the two battles that we need to understand is that the first battle that's going to take place is at the end of that seven-year period of which the first you know, approximately three and a half years is going to be the tribulation and the great tribulation. Then there's going to be the rapture. And then the last, the latter part, the latter three and a half years is when God's pouring out his wrath. At the end of that, of that period where God's pouring out his wrath, there's going to be a battle where the, where the men of the earth are going to gather themselves together to fight against God. And there's also going to be a similar battle. It's a second battle that's after the millennial reign of Christ. That's when you see when it's talking about like Gog and Magog are gathered from the four corners of the earth. So there's one battle that happens right, you know, as, as when Jesus Christ, basically when Jesus Christ comes to set up his kingdom and he comes on the horse to reign on the earth and set up his thousand year reign, there's that battle that, that people are going to be standing against him. And then the second battle is going to happen after that millennium or after that thousand years when Satan is loosed from hell to come out and deceive the people that are on the earth, the rest of the people who are still unsaved, and to deceive them into fighting against God. And, and God is, you know, Jesus is going to open up his mouth and they're all going to be consumed in an instant. It's not even going to be a fight. They're just, they're all going to be wiped out. That's the second battle. So the first battle, let's look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19, look at verse number 11. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. We're talking about Jesus Christ. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So we're obviously, don't worry about your wardrobe in heaven. We're getting white clothing. That's what we're getting. I don't think there's going to be options. I don't think you're going to get different colors. And unfortunately for me, you know, my favorite color to wear is black. It's going to be the exact opposite. I'm going to be getting white clothes. But that's the way it is. And I have not seen any description of anything else other than wearing white clothes in heaven. Um, so anyways, the armies are following Jesus Christ all upon white horses, clothed in white linen. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And I saw the beast, as we jump down to verse 19 now, that was verse 15, verse 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So, this is when the beast is still on this earth, you know, as God's been pouring out his wrath, pouring out his wrath. Um, the beast and the kings of the earth, they gather together these armies and these people to fight against Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is coming on a white horse. He's going to set up his kingdom. So he's going to meet this battle. Verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshiped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So at this moment in this battle, Bible, uh, um, it says the beast and the false prophet are taken and they're just cast into that lake of fire alive. They're taken from the earth and, and they're just thrown in there. And it says in verse 21, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So Jesus comes, comes and he destroys them all. And um, those, all of those that came against him. Now again, I don't believe that every single person that's left on the earth will rise up against Jesus Christ when he comes to set up his throne. It's very specific to say that 
the beast gathers the people together. It says the beast, the kings of the earth, so those wicked kings that were already in charge that were giving their power unto the beast, and their armies gathered together. So the kings have armies, and there's a king and the beast. But it doesn't mean every single lay person, every single person who's on this world is just going to go join in on this fight against Jesus Christ. Some people, I would imagine by this point, would be like, I'm not fighting. I've had enough. You know, <laughs> that, that with all the wrath being poured out. But um, that's that first battle. And then turn to Revelation 20 in the next chapter here. In verse 2, it says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So there, the, the beast and the false prophet, they get thrown into outer darkness, into that lake of fire. But the devil, Satan, is actually goes to the bottomless pit, which would be hell, which is still in the center of the earth. So they're, they're separated, right? Satan goes into hell, and the other two are in that lake of fire. Verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this is where we get to see that great, um, the ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. A thousand years is a long time. You get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And um, verse number five says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So, um, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, one of the things that we get as, as pre-millennial Christians is, is to rule and reign with Christ. And here specifically, he's talking about the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and had not worshipped the beast. So if, this, if these things start to come and happen in our lifetime, and you become martyred, you know for a fact that you will be ruling and reigning in this millennial reign with Jesus Christ, because that's who John witnessed seeing here that, that they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And then in verse 7 it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So we have that full thousand years that happens. At the end of that, that's when the second battle happens. And it's at the second battle when the, the heaven and earth are going to pass away. Look at verse number 11 of Revelation 20. It says, And I saw a great white throne. So this is the great white throne judgment. This is the second resurrection. This is after the, there's a battle. And again, Jesus consumes everybody. When Satan tries to gather all these people up against them, he gathers everybody against him at this battle. And Jesus just wipes them all out just instantly. It's not even with the sword. It just says he burns them up and they're done. And then we have the great white throne judgment. In verse 11 it says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This is now the point where this, this heaven and this earth that we know today are done away with. They're, they're gone. They cease to exist all the way here in Revelation chapter 20. That's when, when that happens, when this, is, when this is all gone. And that's after the millennial reign. So the millennial reign of Christ takes place on this heaven, with this heaven and this earth that we know today. And then it's going to be done away with. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Look at Revelation 21, verse 1. We'll get the description of that and then we'll, we'll close out here. Revelation 21, 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So the new heaven and the new earth, after my own reign, after all this stuff, there's not going to be any sea. There's not going to be any bodies of water. Okay, there's going to be land. 
And verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So when people on, you know, talk about heaven today, when you go to heaven, of course you aren't going to die. Of course you aren't going to pass away. You... Um, won't experience pain, but it doesn't mean nobody will. Okay, so when when it comes to the point of the, the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more death of any kind. Because the unbelievers are all have all gone through that um, the great white judgment where they've been cast into the lake of fire. And all of the dead have stood before God, and that's where they went, is, is to the lake of fire. And um, that's already done. So in the new heaven and new earth, God's going to wipe away all tears. So, and we're going to witness these things too, by the way. We're going to see this stuff happen. So when the Bible says there's not going to be any more sorrow or crying, I believe that just when we go to heaven, we still might experience sorrow. We still might cry until this point because we're going to be aware of things that are going on. Maybe you're going to see loved ones at that great white throne judgment and it's going to be sorrowful. It's going to be sad. Okay? But after that event, after that happens, there's just going to be, God's going to start over with a new heaven, a new earth. He's going to wipe all tears from our eyes. There's not going to be any more death. There's not going to be any more sorrow. No reason to be upset. No reason to be sad about anything. That is going to be an amazing place to be. That is going to be a, a wonderful place to live, but that's going to happen all the way in over a thousand years from now because it's after the millennial reign of Christ when we're in that new heaven and new earth. And real quickly, we'll look at the, at the description of the new Jerusalem. And this is, again, what people get that, that idea of the pearly gates and the streets paved with gold. It's from the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. Revelation 21, look at verse number 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. So look, he's carried now to a mountain. He's not, he's not in heaven anymore. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. And the gates, and at the gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So now he's going to describe all of that. Um, we're going to jump down to verse 18. And the building of the wall was as it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. It would be a beautiful city. We see that it's that the city was pure gold. The city is made up of this pure gold. There's all these beautiful gems that are that are or, um, ornating the 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 wall of the city. There's this great wall. There's twelve gates as entrances into the city. And then it says in verse 21 of Revelation 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So now in this Jerusalem, see in Jerusalem that exists on this earth, there was a temple. But in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, there is no temple. He says that God and the Lamb are the temple of it. Verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So there we see what I was referencing earlier, that, that you know, God provides that light. Flip if you would to Revelation 22. We're almost done. Verse number 1 of Revelation 22 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is in the New Jerusalem. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree 
were for the healing of the nations. Now I've heard people say that you know, when the Bible says there's time no more, that time ceases to exist. That's not true. When the Bible says there's time no more, it's not talking about time in general as a concept of something that, that continues on ceasing to exist. We see here in Revelation 22, it says that that, that tree yielded her fruit every month. If time ceases to exist in the last chapter of the Bible here that's talking about the new Jerusalem, this is like the last thing that's going to happen. This is the last thing that's given to us. This is the farthest out prophecy in time that exists in the Bible that there's this tree, the tree of life, that bears fruit every month. Time does not cease to exist. There's still going to be a concept of time. Um, and it says, And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So, that's, I got to wrap this up. We're already way over time. But um, I don't know. I, I kind of wanted, it's not the best descriptions. We've seen some of them. There's other places in the Bible that will give you some more descriptions. But of heaven, I think we covered pretty much most of it, which isn't a lot. It, we don't know visibly like what we're going to be getting there. We know that there's the throne. We know that there's the elders. We know that there's these beasts. And we know that the beasts are going to be singing praises unto God. And they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They, they say these things over and over again. And it just brings this, this honor and glory unto God. And God's surrounded by all of these creatures and His creation. And, um, and there's a magnificent light and we're going to have white robes and this is or white clothing, white raiment is what we're going to be given. And um, God is going to dwell with us and, and we're not going to be sad. We're not going to be sorrowful. He's going to, he's going to, you know, we're going to get new bodies that aren't going to experience the death that's in our physical body that we have now. They're going to be perfect bodies. We're not going to have the pain and the suffering and all the other things that go along with what we have today. Um, heaven is going to be a wonderful place, but I think it's also important to understand that these three places where we will be at in the future, one place will be literally in heaven, in the third heaven. The second place will be on this earth again with Jesus Christ during that millennial reign. And then the third place that will be in the future is the new heaven and the new earth. They're all different from each other. They all have some slightly different attributes about them. But um, hopefully that will help you understand as you read the Bible and start reading these things and just wondering, hey, what's heaven going to be like? Hey, what's it going to be like on the earth? What's it going to be like in these other places? That's what it's about. All of them are going to be amazing. I can't wait to be a part of it. It's going to be incredible. And um, we just have that faith in God knowing that, that He has created. And, oh, and I didn't even mention, of course, I mean, there's so many things to talk about with heaven, but... Um, you know, Jesus Christ said that he goes to prepare mansions for us, a mansion for us. So we're going we're gonna to have a mansion to live in, to dwell in, which is really cool because it's not going to be just some hut or something that you're going to have. You're going to have a nice place to live in. You're gonna be, heaven's going to be a great place to be. Heaven and the new heaven and the new earth and the millennial reign are all going to be great things. So let's bow right to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. God, um, we thank you for heaven and for preparing a place for us, God, for giving us an inheritance. Lord, I pray that you would please just um, help us to understand the difference between these, all these future events that are going to happen. Help us to know them. Help us to, to, to understand when we read your word what you're talking about. I pray that you would please just um, help us all to focus on laying up treasures for ourselves in heaven, dear Lord. Help us to, to stay focused on that. Help us not to forget the, the horrors of hell and, and how, what a horrible place that is, that we can use that to, to warn others, dear Lord. But we thank you so much for the wonderful gifts and, and for all of the things that we don't deserve at all. But because you love us, you're going to give us these great things and a great place to dwell and that we will be close to you and spend an eternity with you and serving you, dear God, and experiencing the joy that you have laid out for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.